1944, as president of the Virgil Society, T.S. Eliot delivered an address titled What is a Classic? This essay, published by Faber and Faber in 1945 and later included in On Poetry and Poets in 1956, declared, Our classic, the classic of all Europe, is Virgil. By this, Eliot did not mean to suggest that Virgil was the greatest European poet, but rather that Virgil's work represented a maturity of mind, manners, and language, achieving such perfection of common style that it set a benchmark against which contemporary poets could be measured. According to Eliot, a classic can arise only when language and literature are mature, and it must be the work of a mature mind. Eliot devoted 27 pages of his lecture to demonstrating that Virgil embodied these qualities. However, it is only in the final five pages that he addressed Virgil's specific relationship to the Roman Empire and its spiritual continuation throughout European history. Frank Kermode suggests that Virgil's importance for Eliot lay primarily in his role as a proponent of an imperialist myth of Latin and Christian cultural continuity. Eliot begins by defining a classic as a work that reflects the maturity of a culture. He asserts that a classic can occur only when a civilization is mature when a language and a literature are mature, and it must be the work of a mature mind. During this period, Eliot was concurrently drafting the preliminary essays that would culminate in his 1948 notes towards the definition of culture. He also discussed the integral relationship between a people and their national language in his 1943 essay The Social Function of Poetry. These considerations underpinned his identification of a classic with the maturation of a people and their language, as embodied in a singular work produced by a mind capable of fully embracing this cultural maturity. Given the context of his address to the Virgil Society, it is fitting that Eliot, along with acknowledging William Shakespeare, should cite the first century BC Roman poet Virgil as his exemplar. Virgil's epic, the Aeneid, is a masterpiece of the classical age. However, it is not just the subject matter that makes Virgil's poem a classic. Using the Aeneid as his primary example, Eliot emphasizes that a classic cannot be manufactured with such an aim in mind. It is only by hindsight, and in historical perspective, that a classic can be known as such. A classic must emerge from a substantial historical backdrop. The literature and culture of a people must reach a level of sophistication that provides the tools and traditions necessary for a genius to create a classic. Furthermore, Eliot observes, with Virgil's Rome as his model, that a common literary style must have emerged from a society that has achieved a moment of order and stability, of equilibrium and harmony. From such a culture can emerge the final ingredient, maturity of mind, which requires both history and the consciousness of history. Thus, Virgil, equipped with these conditions, was able to produce a work that transcends provincial limitations and stands ready to engage with the broader world stage. This is illustrated by the expansive scope with which Virgil handles his material, which never appears to be according to some purely local or tribal code of manners. It is, in its time, both Roman and European. The result is not merely great poetry but a classic. While a great poet like Shakespeare or Milton might exhaust a particular literary form, a great classic poet such as Virgil exhausts not a form only, but the language of his time. And the language of his time, as used by him, will be the language in its perfection. Therefore, 
A great classic poet expresses the maximum possible of the whole range of feeling which represents the character of the people who speak that language. For a work to achieve the status of a classic, it must transcend purely literary values and encapsulate the historical moment and the language's possibilities. If Virgil is thus the consciousness of Rome and the supreme voice of her language, he must have a significance for us that cannot be expressed wholly in terms of literary appreciation and criticism. Such a poet leaves behind a criterion by which other works may be judged. This defines a classic. It is so quintessentially a product of its time, place, and cultural, linguistic, and historical conditions that it sets a new standard for what that form might achieve, given the right conditions. Eliot does not stop there with Virgil, because Latin, the language of Virgil, became the universal means of communication across diverse cultures due to the Roman Empire's influence. Virgil wrote in a language that no modern language can hope to match in universality. Thus, Eliot asserts, no modern language can produce a classic on the order of Virgil's. He confidently states, our classic, the classic of all Europe, is Virgil. Eliot concludes by implying that in celebrating Rome and placing Roman culture, values, and language at the center of human history, Virgil paved the way for a new epoch. His vision of a common order and ideal harmony led Europe toward a Christian culture which he himself could never know. Eliot's rationale for these broad claims is elaborated in his subsequent essay, Virgil and the Christian World, presented as a BBC radio address in 1951. There, Eliot convincingly argues that Virgil's Roman virtues found a conducive environment in the ethics inspired by Christian teachings. Although Eliot begins what is a classic with modest claims, he ends with expansive assertions. He moves from arguing that a classic must encapsulate an entire people to establishing that classics summarize even greater cultural and historical developments. Eliot likely understood that any reference to classic might evoke memories of the Romanticism versus Classicism debate that engaged English literary thought during the 1910s and 1920s, in which he was a passionate advocate for the classicist agenda. This debate, most famously involving his opposition to J. Middleton Murray, revolved around the importance of tradition amidst rapid social change. In works from the 1923 essay The Function of Criticism to his 1934 book After Strange Gods, Eliot excoriated those he perceived as opposing this view. Even from this perspective, the issue remains significant. The debate between valuing long-established traditions or contemporary needs continues to incite intellectual conflict. For Eliot, who declared himself a Catholic, classicist, and royalist in 1928, defending tradition was a moral imperative. By 1944, with Europe engulfed in World War II, such intellectual animosities seemed less pressing. The exigencies of global conflict likely tempered Eliot's intellectual and moral positions regarding principled conflicts. If Eliot's definition of a classic as a summarizing work holds true, then no classic can rival Virgil's Aeneid in European history and culture because Europe will never again experience such cultural and linguistic cohesion as during Caesar Augustus' reign. Eliot, writing amidst a conflict that left 50 million dead by 1945, understood this deeply. Eliot provides extensive assessments of European literature, particularly English literature, highlighting the criteria he developed for defining a classic. He considers the definition of a classic to be beyond the dichotomy of Romanticism and Classicism, 
enumerating specific qualities that a classic should possess. Eliot differentiates between a universal classic and a classic within a particular language. In his own words, in relation to other literature in its own language, or according to the view of life of a particular period. A classic can only occur when a civilization is mature. It is the importance of that civilization and of that language, as well as the comprehensiveness of the mind of the individual poet, which gives the universality. Eliot argues that it is easier to discern the maturity of a language through prose rather than poetry. He states, one of the signs of a classic approach towards a classic style is a development towards greater complexity of sentence and period structure. He further asserted that maturity of manners and vision must be conveyed through a language that is not crude. Louis Menand places Eliot's literary criticism at the intersection of the non-academic critics who preceded him and the new criticism movement of academics that followed. As Menand observes, Eliot's work bridges these critical traditions, positioning him as a pivotal figure in the evolution of modern literary thought. Eliot articulates that the development of a classic prose is synonymous with the evolution towards a perfection of common style. He contends that a period of classic prose transcends mere conventional writing, akin to the uniform style of newspaper editorialists, and instead represents a community of refined taste. For Eliot, the maturity of a language encompasses qualities tied to a nuanced understanding of time, including a critical sense of the past, confidence in the present, and a lack of conscious doubt regarding the future. In his own words, consciousness of history cannot be fully awake, except when there is another history than the history of the poet's own people. There must be knowledge of the history of at least one other highly civilized people, whose civilization is sufficiently cognate to have influenced and entered into our own. This historical consciousness, he argued, was an essential attribute for both the poet and his language. Moreover, Eliot underscores that the writing of a classic work demands a particular atmosphere, a moment of order and stability, of equilibrium and harmony. He applies this criterion to the 17th century, observing that although the finest English prose might have emerged in that period, it lacked the equilibrium of prose and poetry. While Eliot praises Milton and Dunn for their individual brilliance, he points out their shared limitations. Specifically, Milton is critiqued for employing a prose style that hewed closely to his poetic expression. While Dunn's approach to prose is deemed ineffectual due to its lack of consistent quality and over-reliance on oratory. Eliot's insights offer profound contributions to literary theory and criticism, particularly his examination of the qualities that define a classic work. His perspective on the maturation of language, the importance of historical consciousness, and the necessary conditions for the creation of a classic remain essential considerations for contemporary scholars and literary enthusiasts. In analyzing his criteria for a classic, one gains a deeper understanding of the complexities and nuances that contribute to the enduring significance of literary masterpieces.